Time TV program explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm in English, and I'm Natalia Humanyuk. And welcome to our special broadcast from Mejahiria. Uh, this is the name of the residence of the former Ukrainian president Yanukovych. Once it was the most guarded place in the country, the journalists were not allowed to get in, so every June the 6th, uh, that is the day of journalism in Ukraine, uh, media representatives were coming to the gates to protest against suppression of the freedom of speech. Yet after the revolution, uh, during the first days, the journalists went uh, here and found a lot of documents uh, which were dumped into the lake. The media and investigative reporters has saved that uh, data, uh, which had become the um, evidence of high-level high-level corruption. Mejahiria has become the symbol of corruption, but it had become open to the public, so you can see a lot of people uh, spending their weekends here. Yet this month, June, uh, it's also special because we are celebrating the Media Freedom Days here at Mejahiria, so people coming from around the region, uh, they are gathering for the Mejahiria Fest, where the journalists together especially investigative reporters from Eastern Europe, discuss together uh, what they can do next and how they can protect themselves and how they uh, work together in this new world with the challenges. And now there is a premise for the investigative reporting festival Mejahiria Fest, which is taking place already for four years here. Uh, it's um, not far from Kiev. And um, now there are not just the Ukrainian reporters, but also international investigative reporters, because, you know, there is a lot we can say about the international organized crime, and there is a lot to share. It's not a secret that in Eastern Europe, investigative reporters were always extremely important for uh, promoting de democracy, for keeping their governments accountable when the other institutions were not working. So in today's special broadcast of the Sunday show, we'll talk to the Ukrainian um, reporter Denis Bihus, who has recently just received a prestigious democracy award, international award for fighting corruption in Ukraine, who'll uh, let us know more on uh, what's new in this front in Ukraine, uh, we'll talk to the um, journalist from Russia who has done the Panama paper story on Vladimir Putin. Uh, we'll go into details on how international um, organizations and companies are working with the rich and extremely corrupt governments in Central Asia and Azerbaijan. So this is just part of uh, what we are going to do. Stay tuned. Panama Papers um, had been one of the biggest international uh, journalistic investigation uh, which was covering a number of governments, politicians. Uh, that was a big buzz of the last year, but we would like to know uh, what is the follow-up, uh, what is changing, and we're talking to Paul Rado, who is the executive uh, head of the OCCRP project. Uh, they started with investigating corruption in the Balkans, in Eastern Europe, then in Central Asia, and now this is a really a global project, but of course uh, Paul knows a lot about our region. Um, but starting with the Panama Papers, you know, that is a story, there is a huge success if we speak about the investigation. But now, can we speak about the results, about the impact of that? Because, you know, investigations today, they are making a lot of people kind of discouraged that, you know, all the politicians are corrupt and it leads to nowhere. Do we know about the, I don't know, any kind of things which led to something, which had brought some you know, positive results in courts and elsewhere. Well, uh, you, you're right. I mean, uh, Panama Papers was all about the hypes of the names involved, you know, including names in, in Ukraine and Russia and other uh, countries. But really, Panama Papers is about the whole system. It's a rigged system that was used by corrupt politicians, by criminals, by um, controversial businessmen to actually do business, to make money in an illegal way. So that is what, what's changing with the Panama Papers project. So right now it's much harder for them to do business as, as usual. 
Uh, so I think that changed quite a bit. Even if people were not sent to jail, as it happened in, in a few other countries, uh, in our region is, is harder to put uh, people in jail, especially people in power. Although in my country, in Romania, that happens quite a lot lately for the past few years. Um, but the, the thing is, you know, you gotta uh, attack the system. And Parliament Papers highlighted, exposed the system in, in its entirety. So now it's much harder for these people to use the same mechanisms to do business. So that's very important. And don't forget, um, at the level of the European Union, uh, there's an open investigation into Panama Papers. Uh, there's a group investigating, officially investiga investigating at the level of the European Union. And out of this group, there were a few ideas uh, that came out and that are, uh, are going to become practice very soon. Uh, and one is uh, to create a registry of beneficial ownership at the level of the EU. So no company can do business in the EU without knowing who is the real owner of the company. And that's very, very important because that's exactly how these uh, criminals, how these uh, corrupt uh, politicians and business businessmen do business right now by uh, stealing, you know, European funds, by stealing national funds and all this. And secondly, one, one thing that people must understand about Panama Papers is that this is a gift that keeps on giving. I mean, Panama Papers is not over. Uh, even we uh, published uh, in March of this year an investigation that we titled the Russian Laundromat. It is about more than 20, 20 billion uh, US dollars laundered via banks in Moldova and uh, in Latvia and including you know, connections to Ukraine. A key piece of information for that investigation came from the Panama Papers database. There's a lot, a lot of information there that is not explored yet, that, it, that will be explored, you know, because journalists are working actively. So that's, that's a place where you keep on going to get information. This is why I, I, I say it's, it's something that, that will probably never stop. Uh, because some of the information in Panama Papers can become relevant later in time. And that information coupled with other leaks, coupled with other databases, can create new investigative reporting. And it is creating new investigative reporting. In fact, we're working right now at an investigation that is, uh, I, I, I think it's going to be quite impactful, that we're going to publish in the fall. And some of the information for this investigation comes from Panama Papers as well as from other, other sources. When we talked to a lot of journalists from the region, they said that, you know, they were um, uncovering corruption before and there was a high level corruption we are here in Mejahiria, where the Ukrainian president used to leave and, you know, what we knew about that place was thanks to the investigative reporters. Uh, but how their practices are, uh, are changing? Because what is, what with the corrupt officials and the criminals, they are adapt very fast. As soon as you found uh, something, you put a light on it, they find new ways. So what are now new tricks besides, you know, we knew takes havens, that was the thing, but now, you know, you can dig into that. So. The thing is, I mean, even with tax havens, you know, um, they are still using the old tricks. Um, there are not so many ways to, to go about corruption, to, to do corruption, because, you know, in the end, it's about stealing money from someone's pocket. That's it. You know, you're, you're, you're stealing money from the citizen's pocket. So it's theft. It's simple theft. You can put in between offshores. You can put, you know, better shares companies and all this. So these tricks are still used. And one, one of the main things here is for instance at the level of the European Union, although the European Union is investigating Panama Papers and it's taking all this action against better shares and against, you know, against offshore uh, havens, there are a few countries inside the European Union where you can create companies that ensure more secrecy than the companies that were, issue, uh, that were uh, established by Fonseca in Panama. So in my country, in Romania, there are more than 300 companies that are owned via better shares. Better shares means, you know, a piece of paper where you have 100 shares in a company. Whoever holds that piece of paper in their hand is their company. So if I gave, give you the piece of paper, it's your company. If I put it in my pocket, it's my company without any other uh, documents, you know, attached to it, you know. So, so these are things that are ongoing right now in the EU. You know, we, we don't need to go to Panama Papers. You, we need to clean, clean our house first, you know, and so all the politicians, dirty politicians in the EU are using these tools, you know. So outside of Panama Papers, there's a lot, a lot of work to be done. For instance, in Austria, you can establish private stiftungs, these private foundations that can be used, you know, in various, various ways. And I think actually Mezeria here was uh, owned by a company okay. connected to a private stiftung, you know. So, so there are various tricks that are still used by, uh, so it's, it's still the, the old tricks. Now there will be new tricks, you know, so we see right now money laundering, our latest project about the uh, Russian laundromat, about the 20 billion laundered via banks in the 
the EU, you know, it targeted banks because there were more than 500 banks involved in, you know, dealing with this money. Uh, and now we have Bitcoin and Bitcoin, it's, it's still a small part of the economy, of the world economy. It's, it's really, really small. But if you'll crack down on banks and this needs to happen, you know, lots of criminals will probably move towards Bitcoin, you know, so we'll see if that, uh, you know, how that will go. And then we have to adapt a little bit more and to use more technology in our investigative reporting to be able to expose uh, this stuff. Roma, your investigation, uh, which was called Landromat, uh, that was an investigation with a number of media, but you were working on it, sh showed the uh, how the money were laundered through numbers of uh, European banks, including the Moldovan banks, and it was like a huge amount of money, up to 22 million, as far as I remember. Billion. 22 billion of the US dollars. So what is the, the result? Do we see what's going on with this story? Well, it depends on different countries. So let's say that the main victim is Russia and there are no any results because there were two criminal cases started after our investigation, which started three years ago. And I was witness in both cases and I saw that the investigators, they didn't want to do anything uh, real, let's say, because uh, uh, the criminal cases were started by the laws departments of the investigative committee, which means that the Russian state was not really interested in investigating the case. But simultaneously, uh, we had very good results in other European countries. So uh, there was an investigation started in the UK and there were hearings in Parliament and the Deputy Minister of Finance had to explain, you know, why uh, the British banks and companies were involved in this scheme. Simultaneously, there was a big case in uh, Denmark and the Prime Minister had to say that, you know, he, is, uh, he doesn't like the situation and he's very sorry that it happened with Danish banks and there is an ongoing investigation as well. And uh, the latest news is that uh, two days ago, uh, actually, I, uh, you know, I heard about it just today. A friend of mine, Paul Rado, who was involved in, this, in, in the investigation as well, told me that there is a commission, a special commission inside the European Parliament, uh, which is called the Russian Laundromat, just as our story, uh, that they will uh, study the case. And uh, the main idea is to understand why you, the European banks were involved in uh, the money laundering and why their compliance procedures did not work. So, of course, the people could read the full investigation and we would encourage them again, those who don't know maybe. But really, who are the main beneficiaries, you know, in the end, in this large scheme? There are many of them, to be honest. And uh, so the money was mixed. The money from different crimes was mixed. So the biggest beneficiary we were able to identify was uh, a mysterious businessman uh, who is the main contractor to the Russian railways. Uh, Alexei Krapivin, and uh, he was involved in many, mm, I would say, scandals and criminal cases all over the world. Uh, but uh, among others, there were European uh, parties, uh, I mean, uh, pro-Russian parties, which got the money. Uh, there were multinational corporations like Siemens, like Hitachi and others. And uh, of course, I mean, it doesn't mean that they were stealing the money from Russia, but it means that they were involved in grey import schemes, or you can call them uh, the smuggling schemes. To what extent the big banks can control, and if you generally assess the situation, you know, that there would be the big bank or companies would have their smaller companies in Estonia or the Baltics or elsewhere. So that's kind of a usual way to um, launder the, the funds. Uh, what depends on the headquarters? To what extent the headquarters can, can uh, and are eager to, you know, to remain, uh, have a good reputation and can say that, oh, that was not us. Right, so look, I mean, uh, an important word you mentioned is whether they are eager or not. Because uh, on the one hand, they are not responsible for clients uh, which are out of their bank. So they are responsible just for the clients inside their banks. And uh, they got to check them, they got to control them and so on. But they do not uh, check uh, clients which send money to their clients uh, from foreign countries or from uh, foreign banks. Uh, which was a problem in laundromat case. So what the big banks said, they, they said that, you know, I mean, our client was okay, you know, our client was, let's say, Siemens. But Siemens got money from uh, bogus companies, shell companies, from uh, notorious banks like Trusta Commerzbank. Uh, its license was revoked recently from Moldovan Bank, Moldinkon Bank, and so on. So I would say that uh, the main problem here is the will. 
if the banks want to uh, control the money flows, if they don't want to be involved in these big money laundering scandals, then they got to check uh, not only their clients, but also the origin of the money uh, which their clients get. Regarding the country, Moldova had been particularly kind of in the um, heart of it all. And so that is very special case when you have a small country, which is more or less, uh, you know, so many had been done through that. Um, so really, uh, are you following the case? What's happening in, this, in, in the, lady, the most involved country? Well, uh, look, the main problem here is that the main victim is Russia. And with money laundering cases, uh, you always, in order to prove money laundering, you've got to prove the first crime, because money laundering is always the second crime. So in order to prove money laundering, you've got to prove the predicate, so the first crime. And Moldovans, uh, Moldovans they, uh, the main problem with them was that they couldn't get any talks and help from Russia. So they were asking for help, they were begging for help, and they got nothing. With the results, uh, the investigation have become international, right. uh, the journalistic investigation. But uh, how about the law enforcement? Are they still in our region, in Eastern Europe, uh, able to investigate something on their own? And are the things moving in, in that direction? Well, they are. Let's say that in Russia, the case was pretty well investigated by the operatives from FSB. They did a really, really good job. But when it came to a criminal case itself, because you know that before uh, studying a criminal case, you've got to do a lot of job in terms of proving the crime and so on. So uh, before the criminal case, they did a really good job. Uh, the same in Moldova. But when it came to criminal case, uh, which means punishment for people involved, then the problem starts. Because, you know, uh, in this particular case, uh, some big names were involved, including, uh, including uh, Igor Putin, who is, uh, he's not brother-in-law, I don't remember. Well, he's relative to the president, to Vladimir Putin. And uh, some people from FSB were involved as well. So when it comes to a criminal case, people are not so eager, I mean, the law enforcement, are not so eager to investigate them to, up to the end, because otherwise they would need to imprison those who are in power. So there is always the question, how difficult is really to investigate Putin, you know, and uh, what we really know? Because I think there is a will of the reporters to find out something. Well, we know a lot, but the problem is when you say proving uh, things, Putin is smart, he will never sign any doc and he will never sign any financial records and so on. Uh, so he is a smart guy. So in terms of proving, you know, we've proved a lot, a lot with Panama Papers and with the Raldugin case, because in my opinion, it's not Raldugin's money, it's Putin's money. Yeah? And we, we, we had a lot of collateral proof to say that. Uh, but. I mean, yeah, you're right, you know, there is no any signature by Putin, there is no any signature by anybody else from his family, because they're smart people, you know. But, you know, if we think as law enforcement, we say that there is a bunch of proofs. We couldn't find a man with a gun, you know, who, should, who, who shot somebody, but, you know, we could find witnesses who say that they saw him, we could find, uh, I don't know, wiretaps and so on and so forth. The same with uh, financial crimes, you know, you will, you will not find a dog signed by the president, but you'll find many other dogs signed by people who are close to him. Denis, you've just uh, received the pretty prestigious international award uh, for democracy that was for the anti-corruption fighters. So you're doing the investigative program here in Ukraine, which is extremely popular and I hope and can say to some extent effective. Um, we're speaking now about Ukraine in 2017. And you know, there is something in that, that still the investigative journalist from Ukraine received the international awards for fighting corruption. Um, so what are the, probably the key cases, the most important things in a way how corruption is done today? We have only one thing that they actually have a possibility to steal. It's always people's money. I mean, if you talk about some budget, uh, if you talk about some rules in the country, there is just um, no nothing else. So uh, I'm not sure that for now, uh, tactically, we have some difference uh, between uh, times four years ago. Uh, that's uh, still some uh, public procurement schemes, that's still some monopolies who controlled um, sectors of uh, economy. The difference is that 
For now, we have something that um, I can call corruption competition. I mean, uh, at Yanukovych's time, there was a solid pyramid of corruption. Yeah? So, any official was in, in, this, in this system. And today, um, we have a lot of, uh, I'll say, uh, a lot of wings, yeah, a lot of groups that um, have some comp competition between them. And this is really helpful. Can we speak about some particular spheres, industries? Because, you know, somehow my guess would be from what I'm following that somewhere it's cleaner, more transparent, uh, but that's where there are less money, you know, like or like on the healthcare, uh, there would be the l small corruption with the people paying, but then there would be fields which are really still are very, very close and industries. We talk a lot about transparency and transparency by itself, it's not about corruption. Yeah, uh, I mean, um, for now we have a lot of some transparent sectors and we think that um, I don't know, corruption in this sector gone even bigger uh, than in previous times. It's not true because we just, we just see more. Uh, transparency can't work without some um, judicial system. Yeah? And the, 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 that's a problem for all of us because we, for now we see a lot and uh, still can do um, not so much. Uh, if uh, we talk about industries, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, for now I think it's the same. It's a um, uh, heavy industry, it's a uh, uh, bank sector, uh, it's um, maybe all that um, have any touch to state monopolies, and it's Ukrainian railways uh, as it is. Uh, I think uh, we have better situation for now in um, oil and gas system yeah, that I saw very smart steps in uh, Naftogaz. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, good steps in um, gas sector. Meaning good steps to become more transparent and less, less corrupt or that, that, good okay, steps that, to... That, to that, that's not about transparency yeah when we uh, when we talk about uh, uh, I would say uh, about oil sector and about gas sector that's more about just uh, smart management decision they uh, don't uh, increase transparency level uh, they increase economic level and they increase um, competition in, in on this field and look, are there any particular cases where you have seen that the, there was a result, that the law enforcement was involved and the people, the, uh, those who, about whom you were investigating, your uh, team uh, had been investigating, that they've been at least persecuted? And where it's extremely difficult to see though the results are obvious. If you talk about example, for last uh, month, I think we push... Uh, three criminal procedure against uh, Batkivshina's party, against um, Lashko uh, in touch with his illicit enrichment, and against uh, official from, um, let's say, from tax department. But the biggest problem is that um, if we'll talk about some results, yeah, uh, we have much more um, we have more results when we uh, don't need to connect with the prosecutor's office or with the courts. I mean, if you want to cancel some public procurement, you have to just wrote about it, and someone in this department who control this procurement uh, usually just um, cancel it because uh, nobody wants any problem. Uh, if you need to start any criminal case and, uh, how to say, add any uh, official investigation, uh, okay, uh, that's a problem. 
And look, the, um, the last one, we here at Mezahiria, the former Yanukovych residents. Yeah. But rather the general question, there was a lot of enthusiasm when we have seen the papers of previous president, and there were a lot of, you know, a lot of journalistic cases, uh, the investigation uh, had a good, had good chances to be investigated, though as was even the political will by the Ukrainian opposition at that time, uh, it looked like back then, to investigate their opponents, you know, former party of region and the others. Uh, we can go into details, but in general, how do you see that? At least uh, uh, I can't see any moves in, uh, on this way. Our uh, present officials make a very sweet photo with the uh, former officials from Yanukovych's time. Yeah? That's a um, mm, big, I'd say, big 100 persons nothing how that. i can explain that yeah it's just not they are really you know you can't have their direct link that i don't know president has a connection to that you know guy from the party of region there is not that obvious thing to say that they are have either i'm speaking about a top official that they have a common business or something and they but are still not? political <laughs> opponents but why not you see uh, if all your economy based on maybe 1,000 people, they always connected one with another. Maybe it's not so I know, obvious like uh, they co-founders in some company, but uh, Ukrainian economy, it, it's not big at all. Yeah, I mean, and it's extremely monopolized. And in any moment, um, any I don't know, money bag, uh, have some connection with everyone. So I think you know, we have to look on this not like on the network uh, of some connections, yeah, some separate connections, but uh, look through it like a one big bunch of uh, connections and uh, shared money in very small Ukrainian economy. Natalia Sedlecka is the anchor and the editor-in-chief of one of the most popular and, in, and impactful investigative program scheme for the Radio Free Liberty and has been investigating a lot of high-level corruption in Ukraine here. So Natalia, you know, we're now here at Mezahiria Fest um, trying to you know, assess some of the phenomena. So now, how is it for your team working? What are the, how the corruption in Ukraine has changed and the work of the journalists? You have um, your program and your journalist, the court cases with the security service. And uh, you know, you do have a difficulties today. What are they and what do we need to know uh, the, about how the corruption changed here? Sure, the corruption changed. Um, we could say that under the Yanukovych regime, corruption schemes were much simpler. And uh, on one hand, it was easier to investigate them. Uh, now corruption schemes are more complicated. Uh, but at the same moment, it was we were able, with the help of, uh, uh, of the civil society and or, or, like, or civil organizations, uh, we were able to uh, unclose, disclose uh, the public um, registries. So uh, it made uh, us, uh, it's, it made easier for us uh, to uncover this corruption because we've got open register of uh, companies, open uh, registry of um, uh, assets, of land registry, and so on. So it, it's it's much much uh, easier to investigate. But now politicians um, and corruptioners they just uh, hide it better. Uh, do we know any particular, let's say, industry in, you know which are probably the most closed, where it's the hardest to dig? Uh, the contract, ar army contracts are very closed and it's really hard to investigate uh, p uh, procurements for, for the uh, uh, Ministry um, of uh, Defense. Uh, but also if we, s if we uh, talk where the most corrupted spheres are, I would say that it is state companies, state-owned companies. So it's not like a budget of some ministry, but it's state companies which are throughout Ukraine and are still owned by the government. 
you uh, your journalists had been you know followed by the security service um, also there is a you know a defamation campaign against you against some of the um, your team uh, reporters um, so really how Im how does it impact your work and really what are current uh, you know, your relations with the state, with the law enforcement? Yes, so the, secret, uh, the security service of Ukraine uh, is the structure which is still um, unreformed and it's still very, very close. Uh, to a contrary of other law enforcement agencies, they haven't published uh, publicly their uh, assets declaration. Uh, just w w and the law says that they should have published them. So now it's, uh, it is still the law enforcement structure that is really hard to investigate their potential corruption inside of the structure. That's why we are looking very closely into them, into, into the workers that are working there. We have heard so many complaints on one specific department of security service of Ukraine. It's called uh, economical department. Um, they have to defend economy of Ukraine. So we heard from business and entrepreneurs so many complaints on this department that they are just uh, simply, you know, uh, like uh, starting to a criminal case and then by paying money, uh, this criminal case will be closed and so on. So then we thought, how can we prove and, and in any kind, uh, in any way this. So we simply went to this department and uh, we put a camera and we were filming what cars these people that are working in this department are using. And uh, these people are uh, making about um, probably not more than four, five hundred dollars per month. But they are driving cars starting from um, uh, 20, 30, 40, and 50 thousand dollars. So their cars are much more expensive than they could afford by their governmental salary. Um, and uh, w just w we sent a, r a request to secret uh, to security service of Ukraine asking, uh, saying that we're going to publish this report. Are you going to comment on this before publishing? They haven't responded and uh, imagine just one hour prior to um, our program on air we receive a letter from security service of Ukraine which says that if you're gonna publish this story in this way uh, this, there, there, sh there will be a criminal responsibility uh, by your journalists because we are secret service and it's uh, not allowed to publish information about our, our employees. After that, we published the story uh, because I thought that they were just trying to threaten us because what they do not want is to publish the information not about their secret agents, there was no secret agents in, in our story, but they don't want to publish information that these people somehow are making much more money uh, unofficially. I would say a dispute uh, between civil society activists and some people from the government, we would be blamed like grant eaters, mm -hmm. there is a Ukrainian term, or those who like panickers, so the people who are not seeing that there are good results sometimes, trying just to see the bad side of the government, you know, uh, make, uh, w which especially at this time make Ukrainians very depressed and, you know, um, underestimating the good things so what, which are done sometimes by the government uh, in a very difficult times, in the time of the war um, of Russia. So, you know, like, because, I don't know, like, the more corruption we show, there would be more funds coming for our companies. Uh, what would you say on that discussion? And you know, like, aren't really we are, you know, seeing just the bad things and not mentioning the good things? I think it's a role of investigative journalism to criticize the government and to find facts, you know, that have, uh, have been wanted to be hided, you know, to, to uncover such facts. It's just a role. We, we do not uh, we, we do not have to say about like good things only, you know, we have to uncover bad facts, that's true. Uh, but I think that all this agenda um, that it's not patriotic to criticize the government, it's uh, inspired by corruptioners mainly who just want to, the system to not change. You were working a lot with international companies on the money laundering schemes right. and um, so in them there was always and still we understand that a lot of money laundering may take place because there are the Western companies, there are tax haven. Uh, 
and the, some of the government they cover, they let those schemes to take place. Do we see any development? Uh, and do we see that, you know, in the end, um, your old investigation could be, you know, could end in something and there would be some results, the court, uh, the convictions? Absolutely, there are already results. Yes, of course, people don't get directly to jail right after the investigation. There should be some process, but also there is no uh, straight effect from investigative journalism, and especially in countries like Ukraine. But there, I would say, major impact of that is that uh, after some of uh, after some stories, we've got new uh, legislation adopted. Let's let's say public registries are open, electronic uh, declaration is uh, law is adopted. Um, actually, the um, National Anti-Corruption uh, Bureau was also uh, created because. Uh, it was a long history of investigating corruption and, a lo and, 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 and not only, of course, but it's a small piece of, of, of it. But still, I think it's a um, uh, result in strategical result and, and not fast result m mainly. Uh, but if we talk about more international aspect and um, especially on offshore problem, uh, I have a personal um, experience and personal uh, story because two years ago uh, I was in Great Britain uh, taking part uh, into um, British investigative documentary about uh, the dirty money flowing into London uh, through offshore companies uh, the, like corruptioners like Ukrainian or Russian corruptioners are purchasing real estate. Um, and um, on, on the name of um, uh, companies, offshore companies, and nobody know who the real owner is. Uh, so this uh, documentary got big impact in, 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 uh, the, uh, in, in the UK. And after that, the, some legislation was adopted in the UK. And it says that you have to disclose who, who the real owner is. And this campaign on uh, disclosing offshore anonymity is going through the whole world. Uh, there are a new, uh, few new initiatives um, uh, regarding uh, disclosing of public registries in many, many countries, also in offshore world. So I think it's a good tendency and uh, there is a development. Miranda, you are... Um the regional editor for OCCRP, Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, and you are dealing with Azerbaijan and uh, Central Asia, uh, which are really the, well, there is no secret, this is authoritarian regimes. Uh, in general, we know that there is corruption there. There is no really democratic process to that the corruption would influence the society. But really, what are the stories we're working now? What a development? What is the recent development? We follow, you know, the really <coughs> very tragic cases of the persecution of the Azerbaijan reporters. Uh, we hear less about the Central Asia, though we know that people are pushed away from the region, those who are investigating. Well, in terms of Central Asia, any journalists that really did any stories that authorities didn't agree with are already, uh, you know, they have already left the country. Uh, and this is something that's been going on for, you know, five, ten years. So it's not new. I think what's happening in Azerbaijan now is a real crackdown that took place many years ago in Central Asia. Um, these countries are operating in complete impunity. You know, what you know here is, uh, you know, judiciary, uh, I I police, independence doesn't exist there. Uh, you will be framed with, you know, illegal drugs or you will be just accused as a journalist for attacking a policeman and that will take you for a month in jail. So, uh, and, and then, you know, you can be charged with corruption or uh, with illegal work and that could be, you know, years long sentences. Uh, I think what's also going on is that uh, authorities are cracking down on access to information. So even where you had the ability to report and obtain documents, it's now becoming increasingly uh, difficult. Uh, the media are close, uh, being closed down. In Azerbaijan, the most recent thing is that, for example, RFERL Azeri service is not allowed. Basically, the, their website is blocked. So they can't even, uh, you know, reach the audience inside the country. So the authorities are really working very hard to shut down any kind of independent voice 
or any kind of criticism of their actions? Um, so, for instance, in particular with Azerbaijan, in case of Aliyev, you know, there was so much evidence, international evidence, and we're speaking about a really, really big money because it's an oil-rich country. Uh, so really, what are the things we can, you know, tell? Because it's kind of, yeah, he's corrupt. It's there. But what are the ways really to do something with that? You know, maybe there are sometimes the involvement of the Western companies, which are more transparent, and sometimes you can, you know, find something. And how do you see the reaction of the, of the you know, um, let's say international law enforcement, which might somehow find something that there would be at least, you know, at least any, uh, I wouldn't say punishment, but at least any, you know, result, any procedure, um, any investigation. Well, Azerbaijan is, is very good into bribing their own way into US and EU. I mean, when the President Trump was inaugurated, one of the first the clients in his hotel was actually Azerbaijan embassy who paid for a lavish party on the day of inauguration. Um, they have been uh, bribing, you know, EU officials. It's, it's a well-known case of uh, MP Volante from Italy who has received money to basically support uh, Azerbaijan. You know, for a long time, Azerbaijan was putting a fake fa a, a face uh, with the European Union saying, oh, we want to be close to you, we want to um, cherish European values. And then on the other side, they have been slowly cracking down on journalists and uh, activists and so on. Um, other problem is that, yes, it is a very oil-rich country. Uh, in, European and U.S. companies have massive interests in Azerbaijan. Um, there is a lot of money to go around. And I think part of, of the problem is that in, uh, you know, from the European perspective, what you see is a very rich family, you know, buying properties in London, um, opening exhibitions. Uh, you know, they ran a massive foundation which has been building statues all over Europe paying a lot of money. So what they see is, uh, you know, richness and influence, and they don't really care about, and they don't know about uh, corruption and how regular people live. And uh, is there any movement of the Western governments? Because, you know, we are speaking about, I mean, we at Hromadsky, we as a Ukrainian investigative journalist, uh, who, uh, you know, who had to be, be interested in the corruption in the region because it's so connected started to raise the issue, the, the issue. We are following to the commands of the foreign governments, the bank officials who say that, you know, there should be more transparency in money laundering. But do you feel there is any kind of movement? And among, among some of the politicians, there would be some who are really uh, eager to fight those on the European and international level. I think all the reporting about, uh, especially Hatija, a case of Hatija Ismailova, who was jailed for seven years and released after a uh, huge international pressure, uh, basically is opening eyes in Europe and people are um, more skeptical, at least, about Azerbaijan and the, the first family of Azerbaijan. I think what we need to do very often in, in countries like Azerbaijan, Central Asia, you know, average people in our countries don't know how bad these countries are. What they see is a postcard perfect images of, uh, you know, huge glass buildings, the richness, the wealth, but they don't see the real life of Azeri people. And I think we as a journalist, uh, we need to speak about it and show the true picture. I think there are also consequences. I mean, we did one of the stories about the gold mine that was owned by the first family. It turned out the family couldn't sell their gold because it became publicly known that they were behind the gold mines. So they, they were forced to, you know, pass on that business. And I think that showed that there are consequences. And I think more reporting we do, the more effect it will have. If we speak about Central Asia, there are, uh, because they are not so trying to reach the West, they are not so, uh, you know, probably well known, so there is not that much international interest. But we speak about Turkmenistan, which is one of the closest countries globally, uh, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, yeah. They have really different things in there, but what are really the stories to follow? You know, Kyrgyzstan is semi-democracy, Tajikistan, uh, I think things are getting worse there, what we know with the family and his, I don't know, son who might become the president uh, in a couple of years and currently the mayor of the capital. We had a story of the Uzbekistan where we have Karimov as the probably the dictator of the region who passed away um, last year. But still, you know, so 
that's maybe confusing for a lot of people, but I think it's very important that these stories are becoming prominent. So would you, you know, let us know a bit in some of the stories to follow in this region? Well, I, I, I think, you know, Central Asia is actually where we can have an effect. Um, we've done a lot of stories uh, in the past couple of years, basically proving Western companies paying massive bribes uh, in order to enter the, the markets in, you know, Uzbekistan, enter the markets in Tajikistan, because this is a big market with a lot of money to be made. And every Western company basically have their fingers on it and they want to make money. And I think the good thing about our part of the world is there is a rule of law. And if our company goes and bribes some official in Tajikistan, in Uzbekistan, the authorities here will react and will either find the company or they might be even a prosecution. I think in case of Gulnara Karimova, which um, I worked on together with SVT, yes, she's the former, yeah. She, you know, she's now in the house arrest. Uh, people who worked with her, were laundering money for her are all jailed in Uzbekistan. The, the U.S. authorities are looking for to recover more than billion dollar. Uh, you know, uh, Tilia Sonera will be fined probably about uh, 800 million dollar or over a billion dollar for bribing the uh, the regime. Uh, Vimplecom has already been um, fined hundreds of millions of dollars. So I think there are consequences, and I think you know the way we what we can do is. Um, you know, somebody in Uzbekistan doesn't care about keeping money in Uzbekistan. You know, they're not stealing in order to own a massive palaces there. What they're stealing for is in order to, um, you know, have palace in France, in the UK, in Hong Kong, in the, uh, you know, and, that's, and these are also places where they'll keep their money. So as long as we watch out for this, report about the uh, corruption, report about the bribe, there is a chance that that money will be recovered for the people. Can you give more details on the development in Tajikistan? Because this is probably the least covered country. It's the poorest. You know, there is some speculation, you know, Kyrgyzstan, the pe journalists still can travel there. Uzbekistan is also very, um, you know, rich in terms of resources. Kazakhstan is trying to get poor investment with their gas companies. But this country where really for a lot of time had been ignored because it's poor, it doesn't have that much oil reserve, uh, but that's what we know that it's really now when there are more and more journalists kicked out and there is some kind of the, even the worst situation. Well, Tajikistan, you know, president has many daughters and uh, those daughters nine, are a husband, think. yes. And not and the <laughs> nine, and any time you do the investigation about one daughter, Yes, and uh, you know the president is very sensitive about his daughters, but even more about the son-in-laws who are basically running the business. And uh, what we have done, you know, the, these people, uh, the, you know, one son-in-law will own literally his own empire, and this empire would control, you know, a huge percentage of the economy. It's going to range from the mines till, you know, even, um, you know, issuing uh, car license plates in, in the country. So basically, you have one family which is trying to control the whole country. Okay, so uh, keep up the good work. I think it's really, you know, I mean, being a Ukrainian, we know how difficult it is sometimes to raise an international attention when it's needed, because, you know, it's not just about them, but about the fact that, I mean, the money are laundered elsewhere, and you still expect from the West some standard, if you speak about the values and the rule of law. And really, then you you see the Central Asia, where you know, even we don't pay enough attention to explain what's happening. Well, as a journalist, it's a fascinating region for me. You know, uh, in my part of the world, if somebody steals a million, you think it's a big deal. Um, in that part of the world, people steal in billions. And you know, I, and, and and they do it so bluntly and without even trying to hide. Uh, they act as, you know, there is nobody who will ever do anything to them. I do think it's also the interesting thing because, you know, the, the, the region is still a sphere of influence of Russia. So there is a, you know, the Western companies trying to come, but therefore it's not so under the scrutiny of the foreign reporters as some others region where there is a long history of the Western companies working. That is true. I mean, foreign reporters are normally not allowed in, and then if you do, if you are allowed in the country, you will be followed. And I think we do more damage than good by basically, for example, working with the local reporters who then get harassed and you know lose job or um, are, are suffer in, in in other ways. I think you know those are the countries where uh, secret services 
um, conducting massive surveillance. They're monitoring all the communications. You know, your hotel might be bugged. You might have a camera in your hotel. So as a Western reporter, you need to be extremely careful what you do and, and how you act. Scott, you're an investigative reporter from the Washington Post and um, you were dealing with the difficult cases of investigating your own security service, Homeland Security in the US, Abu Ghraib. Um, so, you know, this isn't, especially the Abu Ghraib story, it's kind of an old story, so we knew that there was an abuse by the, uh, the US Army in the prison in Iraq. If you speak about the investigation of the Abu Ghraib, you know, mm -hmm. that was kind of like game changer because there was still uh, when when the the story had been brought uh, to the light uh, there was the you know still the US tried to play this you know the the, 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 the good power which you know try to you know we're speaking about the freedom speaking speaking about the democracy and it, it was kind of an evidence you know that what how, how many wrongdoings the Bush administration had been doing there later there was a Guantanamo but with this kind of investigation, what was the impact? Had it changed the way the uh, the army um, operating, uh, especially in these sensitive cases of dealing with the suspect terrorists? You know, what are still the practices which are existing, and what are maybe the government had to respond and to stop? The, the, our investigation showed that the uh, the abuse at Abu Ghraib and at Guantanamo Bay was much deeper and broader than was previously disclosed. So the administration at the time said that the Abu Ghraib abuses and the abuses at Guantanamo were isolated incidents and they were confined to just a, a, a small band of, of army um, men and women, but that wasn't really the case. And when we were able to get access to all of the documents and all of the photographs um, and the internal investigations, we quickly realized that this was part of a concerted effort uh, by the military and by the CIA to, uh, to, to break down uh, these detainees and to try to get as much information as possible out of them. Pleaded with us not to publish it. They believed that the military was going to be um, at risk if we publish this information. Um, and we decided to go ahead and publish it because we believe that, that the, what the military was doing, a lot of the military lawyers and a lot of the people in the military felt that that had crossed the line and that by torturing uh, detainees was a violation of the Geneva Conventions. And by doing that, that we were putting our own servicemen and women at risk if they ever got caught, ca caught or captured, that they would be tortured as well. So, in a way, we felt that we were doing a public service by exposing this. Were the people punished in the end? You know, they're, they're, because there is always the case. There is a big story right. in the media, there are a lot of talks, and then there is a long court hearing, and sometimes these cases are kind of dropped from public memory. Right. So, a small band of people were convicted um, of crimes for abusing uh, the prisoners but the people up the chain of command were not held accountable. Um, and to this day, they've never been held accountable. I think it's absolutely outrageous, because uh, these are the people who were responsible for the command and control of Abu Ghraib. They're responsible for the men and women under their command, and they should be held accountable, just like anybody else should be held accountable. Um, are there any tools which you are following that the law enforcement uh, agencies could really implement in order to be more, let's say, accountable be, be, be more transparent. It's really the, 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 the difficult situation. We understand we, have, we are in a country in, war, in a war where there is a security threat, where you people, you definitely sometimes talking to, I mean, the criminals or suspect terrorists. So there is a chance to cross the line. So mm -hmm. what are practices maybe had been enforced and might be enforced that this line, it's more difficult for them to cross. Um, we have uh, whistleblower protections in, in our country. So a whistleblower is somebody who comes forward, blows the whistle and says, I am a witness to crime, I'm a witness to wrongdoing, I'm a witness to corruption. And so we have some um, uh, processes that are in place that protect people who do that. In the military, they're, they're, they're not that strong. And so I think uh, strengthening those protections 
so that it not only uh, encourages people to come forward when they see wrongdoing, but protects them from retaliation when they come forward and report wrongdoing. How common is the practice of the cover-up in law enforcement? How common is this idea of whistleblowing? The officer would you know, cover the soldier and the general would cover the officer. The person who, um, who reported the Abu Ghraib um, uh, abuse uh, was not protected and, and he, his life was threatened. He had to move his family. He had to uh, leave the town that he grew up in. Um, so his identity was actually disclosed by the then Secretary of, uh, of, the, of the Defense. Hopefully we've learned from that and we protect these people. It's really important to protect them and they come forward. You know, how would you explain the relations uh, of your investigative unit, of, you know, Washington Post investigative unit with the, you know, the security services like NSA? Papers like the Washington Post. Um, they're independent, but they're close to government. The government usually needs them. You have the press corp. You do the, a lot of stories. You need to have the, you know, the interview the top officials. So at the same time, uh, they need these papers. At the same time, there is an investigative unit which digs into this heart of the system and um, does something they would really dislike. Mm -hmm. So there is this kind of a general brand of Washington Post and investigative unit. So how you build the relations? Our, our newsroom is completely independent of the government. Yeah. Um, and we, we do not cooperate with them. We do not share information with them. We see ourselves as a check and a balance on the power of the government. And none of our reporters would ever compromise um, their positions or their integrity. Uh, to get access to a story. And if somebody doesn't want to give us access to something and they want something in return, we don't do deals like that. We will walk away from it. And if somebody denies us access, sometimes it's almost a badge of honor and we are able to get the information in other ways. The security service always put this argument that it's about security. How you answer this question for yourself? Where are the cases where you have doubts? Would you endanger really? You know, are you going too far? How you and your journalist, what are red lines for you? So it is a balancing act. And so we always listen very carefully to the intelligence services. Sometimes the White House will contact our top editors. Sometimes the head of the CIA or NSA will contact uh, our, our, our top editors. In the case of Abu Ghraib, the Secretary of Defense and his people contacted our top editors. And so we will always listen to them. We'll ask them why they believe that the disclosure of this information um, is perilous to maybe people in the field, maybe it would expose methods and sources, maybe it might expose intelligence agents and get them killed. You know, we obviously don't want to do anything that's going to uh, expose ongoing investigations um, and, or expose intelligence sources. So we'll always listen to them and then we decide what we think is the most important thing for our readers.